Well, welcome to this uh, final part of the tutorial. And I promised to look later at the issues of gamma, gamma rather, and linear workflow. So we're going to start off by texturing the box that the pills come in. So I've modeled the box. I'm not going to go through this step by step because it's pretty simple and follows a similar workflow to the ones we've used before. But I am just briefly going to recap how to apply textures to this box. Uh, now, in most cases, for an object like this, which is geometrical, box-like, in fact, it is much easier to export it as an OBJ file from Houdini and use one of the many uh, more sophisticated UV unwrapping pieces of software. Uh, even Blender has a better uh, UV unwrapping tool than Houdini, uh, but I will just show you how to do it here in Houdini. So uh, what I'm going to do is use a UV unwrap, and UV unwrap splits uh, box-like items into uh, a series of planes and tries to associate those planes with the main surfaces on the box. So let's just see what the result of that has been and we can see there in this view the UVs that that's created and I'm going to just split this window and then we're going to examine the 3D model side by side there it is and for some reason that's a long way from our plane, but uh, we will use it nevertheless. So what I should be able to do now is select primitives here, and they should show up here in my UV view, and that's indeed happening. And that way I can tell which face is which. And the only faces I'm really interested in are this top one and this side one, because we're not going to be able to see the others. So what I want to make sure is that these two overlap. So I need this to come down here and overlap with that. And I can select, let's move into this view, and I can go into a UV edit mode. And let's just select all of those and move this down so that it's pretty much next to this, like so doesn't have to be perfectly accurate. And then I'm going to select vertices and I'm just going to select the two rows of vertices which are intersecting just here, like so. And then I'm going to use a UV fuse. Now by default this has merged everything into a single point. I want to use the distance based method and I just want to increase this, there we are, we can see, until those UVs merge, which they've now done. And we can check whether this is working by putting a UV quick shade on here. And that will automatically uh, set up a texture. And I think that's working. It's a bit hard to tell because it seems to overlap completely with the thing there. So, of course, the other thing I need to do is to just to uh, move all of this around so it fits again in the UV grid. So let me just select primitives again. And I'm going to now select connected geometry. And I'm going to use UV connectivity. So that should mean that I can select all of that once and I'm going to lay down a further UV edit and I'm just going to move this up to here, this one up to here, and this one up to there. So that's all now in the UV space. Let's move back to our quick edit and what we should see yep, is that that is indeed overlapping nicely here to produce what we want. So that's our texturing setup. So I'm going to use the same workflow that we used for texturing the silver base of the pill uh, capsule to 
text to this. So I'm going to export an image and then use a paint program to create uh, what we want over the top. So what I've got here now is the texture that's completed and we can see that it uh, neatly covers the box. I've also included a specular map so that the outside of the box can be shiny and the inside which has a slightly papery texture applied to it can be matte. So at the moment I've just got this applied using a constant shader but I probably want to create a more complex shader, a Mantra Surface Builder. So let's do that. Um, and what we need to do first is just give it a color map. So that's this box text dot jpg. And I also want to give it a reflection map. Uh, let's increase the specularity and use a specular map, which again is box spec.jpg. So this should now render properly. So let's have a look and let's render the camera, see what it looks like. So that's looking more or less okay at the moment. Uh, and we can come back and tweak that later. Uh, in fact, of course, that's still the constant shader applied there. I haven't changed it, so uh, let's do that. See whether this works. It's recalculating. There we are. And now it's got the, the proper shader. Well, that now brings me on to gamma correction. And you may have noticed that this image has got a great deal darker. And that's because I've, let me just put up the color correction options, I've reduced the gamma from 2.2, which is what we had earlier, to 1. Now, the role of gamma is rather complicated, and it's not necessary to understand it fully in order to understand what a linear workflow is when working with rendering. Gamma derives from the age of the cathode ray tube in the early days of computing. And then, as now, uh, you would represent a color digitally by a number between 0 and 1. The 0 would be black, and 1 would be the brightest white. And somewhere in between, at 0.5, you'd have a mid-gray color. The problem was that if you converted this directly into voltages heading into your cathode ray tube, you would find that a voltage, a maximum voltage, would indeed produce the brightest possible color, and obviously a voltage of zero would produce black. But if you put in half the maximum voltage, corresponding to a value of 0.5, you didn't get a brightness that was halfway between the brightest and black you've got something much darker. And that's because the response of the cathode ray tube was not linear. In other words, 0.5 didn't correspond to a color that was half as bright as white. So in order to adjust for this, uh, something was created called a gamma correction. And we don't need to go into the mathematics of it, simply to know that the amount of adjustment is represented by a single number, which corresponds by to how much you have to increase the voltages, if you like, going into the cathode ray tube, so that the image is perceived to be as it was intended. And in general, that means for the lower, darker areas of an image have to be made more bright. And this has become embedded in the standards of modern computing so that when you look at a image uh, a jpeg or a png image or a photograph on a computer you're almost always looking at something that has already been adjusted uh, to take a certain gamma into account and this is true even though today 
modern uh, displays don't really have the same issues as cathode ray tubes. But it has remained the case that most images are corrected for gamma. And they use, in general, a gamma of around 2.2 or even for some photographs 2.5. Let's then look at rendering. All rendering is doing is basically taking a series of numbers in one end, doing something with them, and pumping them out the other end as color information. Your renderer does not take into account any gamma correction. It just adds numbers together, calculates with them, and spits them out the other end. It doesn't care whether they've been corrected for gamma or not. In other words, it works linearly. 0.5 is half as bright as 1 in the eyes of the renderer. And this can create problems because quite often you're combining textures or photographs which have been corrected for gamma with things like colors that you've just chosen in the interface which are not corrected for gamma. And this can lead to some difficulties in getting your image to look just right. So that's why uh, we can use a linear workflow. And I'm going to demonstrate how a linear workflow works. Uh, and it's quite easy to set up in Houdini, easier than many other applications. Well, that's a lot of talking. Uh, let's see how it actually works in practice. So. I'm going to go here to my edit options and I've got something here called color settings and there are two tabs one of which allows you to determine the color of the user interface the second tab is color correction and I've enabled all of these boxes here and what this allows me to do is to set a gamma which will be used to display images that are rendered and also for the color swatches in Houdini. Now, if we use gamma correction here of 2.2, it's going to mean uh, that we're converting the perceived color here back into its original linear state. And the aim of linear workflow is to get everything coming into the renderer based on linear calculation so with all of the gamma removed so the first step is to take this and apply this and what we'll see is that our display will be changed when we render that will be changed and also these color swatches have changed you probably can't tell that this is brighter than it would otherwise be so you're going to by default choose a color that you perceive as the same shade as before, it's actually going to be darker in reality. So once we've done that, uh, we've got most of the way to using a linear workflow because now whenever we choose colors in the interface, we are in fact going to be uh, selecting things which have been adjusted to take account of gamma and to get rid of it. But there's a big group of, of things which aren't being taken care of in this method uh, and those are to use images. If we have external images they have gamma correction. So we need to take that gamma correction away and then feed those images in after they've been corrected. And we can do that fortunately in the compositor. So let me bring up the compositor and lay down composite node and let's bring in that file texture that we were just using and it's called boxtext.jpg and we can visualize it here here it is and we need to remove the gamma now how do we know what gamma is encoded into this image well in general, you can assume that the gamma is around 2.2. If you created it in a paint program like Photoshop, which is what I've done here, if you've imported an image from a camera, 
you've downloaded a texture on the internet, then in general the gamma is 2.2 and we need to adjust for it. So let me lay down a gamma node and I need to reverse that gamma. You'll see if I increase this value then the picture gets brighter but I need to reverse it. I need to take it down to 0.45 and the reason I do that is because this is 1 over 2.2 so what we're doing is removing that 2.2 gamma and then I need to write it back out as a texture and I'm going to send it as a ROP file output and I'm going to create a texture here. Let's uh, put it in the image directory and let's call it box text dot rat. And what I want to make sure is that it is being saved with the right depth. And to do that, I need to insert a convert node, and I'm going to convert it to 16-bit floating point. And the reason I'm doing that is because we want uh, the information in here to be retained. If I just used 8-bit integer, this division here, this, this darkening of the image, will result in us losing some information. So it's better to convert it into a floating point image. So let me just render that. And that's done. And we can bring it in just to demonstrate. And there it is, and we can see that it indeed it's off the screen here, but you can see that it's a 16-bit floating point image. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to automate this process of converting textures. You can use the iConvert command line utility to convert uh, a JPEG image or some other image into a .rat, .rat format but it doesn't allow you to convert the gamma. Uh, so the best solution is probably to use a third party set of image utilities such as Image Magic, which will allow you to convert your JPEG texture into a floating point TIFF file, for example, and adjust the gamma. And then you can convert the floating point TIFF file into the RAT file. So just to recap, for textures which you have painted or which come from photographs or you've downloaded from the internet, in general you need to convert them in this way to adjust the gamma. Where uh, you have a high, high dynamic range image such as a .exr file or a .hdr file, you don't need to perform this conversion because those files are already encoded in a linear fashion. If uh, you have other information, such as a bump map, or some kind of reflection map, or a specularity map, you also don't need to convert those textures because the information in those textures is not intended to be used to represent color. So this, this conversion of gamma doesn't really apply. So here's a summary of that up on screen. Uh, and let's move on now to finalize this image. So first, let's uh, test the render here. So let me go into my shop context, have a look here at the box texture. And instead of using the JPEG version. I'm going to use the RAT version that we just created with the gamma adjusted. 
and then I'm going to render a view through the scene camera and I'm going to pause uh, this recording while we do that. So there we have it, uh, the render. And we can see that this looks pretty similar to what it did before. Uh, so the differences are quite subtle. The main difference is here in this silvery material, which now looks much more silver in the gamma of 2.2. When you come to save an image manually from this viewer, uh, we can see that the output gamma is enabled at 2.2. That's because I set that in the color options up here. When you use mplay, uh, it doesn't always uh, work. You sometimes have to add in the 2.2 gamma manually. What happens if you're rendering out a series of images uh, using uh, a render node? Uh, so you, for example, you've got this set out to a set of files rather than the viewer. Well, by default, uh, Mantra doesn't prov provide any gamma correction on the images it writes out. And the reason for that is that it's normally using a 16-bit float output and you're expecting to do the gamma correction in a post-process. If you do want to do gamma correction as part of the render uh, rather than in your compositor, then you can edit uh, the rendering parameters. And we can't see it here. I'm searching for gamma. It's off the bottom of the screen. And we can see that there is a gamma value here, which we can install. Uh, and that will, when we accept this, appear, let me just switch off the render, will appear down here at the bottom. And you can set the output gamma of your image here. Uh, you can also, by the way, set it uh, for individual planes by installing that other gamma value that we saw listed. So uh, one more thing on rendering, which is I think here on the sampling tab or maybe on the shading tab. Here we are. There's a control here called color space and it's either linear or gamma 2.2. And this is to do with the way uh, the renderer samples at points in the image. In general, uh, it will sample less in very dark areas of the image because noise will be less visible there than it is in the very bright areas. And that's a very sensible strategy. Uh, but the renderer needs to know which areas are really dark and which are not. And that depends on whether the final image is going to be gamma corrected. The gamma correction of 2.2 will gen generally brighten the image, so areas that were dark become brighter. So what this control does is ensure that that sampling algorithm takes account of the fact that the image is going to later have a gamma correction applied. So in general, when you're using linear workflow, you want to set this to gamma 2.2. So I'm now going to finalize this image by adding a second uh, set of pills just here and creating the pills themselves. And I'm not going to go through that step by step because it doesn't really add much to the techniques that we've already demonstrated. So I will add those elements and then come back and say a bit about how I did it. So this scene is more or less done. I just want to demonstrate a couple of final things. One of which is uh, an arrangement for adjusting the lights. And we have covered this before in an earlier tutorial, but I just wanted to recap. So for example, if I want to position this light here, uh, what I can do is split the view left to right and go into render view on this side. Now, another thing you can do to speed up the render, if you're just interested in broadly the, the shape of the light, uh, the shape of how the light is falling, you can go into your output node and you can override the camera resolution here. This is in the output tab. And if we override 
camera resolution, there's some useful options here which allow you, for example, to go down to a quarter of the normal resolution. Let's render this. And then let's go back to the object level, go into my area light. And now as we move the light around, we can see that we can get a broad idea of what the render is pretty quickly. The other thing I want to just do uh, is to change the color of the pills in the second packet of pills. So let's go to that packet and we've got our pills. Sorry, this is the second lot of pills here. And all we need to do is to change the color of the pill material. Now we don't need to recreate the entire pill material to do that. What we can do is use this drop down menu here and say select and create local material parameters. And there's a parameter called base color, so let's accept that. And we can see that's the pink color that we had earlier. So let me instead have perhaps a kind of greeny color of more or less the same hue, more or less the same intensity rather. And that should give us uh, some green colored pills over here. Let me just briefly say what I've done to create uh, the second set of pills. Uh, first of all, what I did is parent together all these three sets of uh, pills pill packet. So we've got the top plastic, the bottom and the pills and they're all parented together and that's the first slot. For each of these second one I'm just bringing in the equivalent, uh, the top, uh, the pills themselves and the bottom. I'm bringing it in using an object merge with the transform set to none and that means that I can use these transforms here to maneuver it to a new position. And the floor is simply a, a grid. The other thing I've done is with the pills uh, which I've created here, we start with a curve. Let me just hide other objects. Start with a curve, we revolve it, we reverse it so that the normals are the right way out, we polybevel bits of it, we subdivide it, we UV project just onto the top surface then we transform it into the right place. We copy it using uh, this version of copy that's going to translate each copy by a certain amount. We copy it again to produce the second row. And that gives us our set of pills. Uh, the material for the pills is a pretty simple diffuse material, except I've also set up a bump map here with that uh, texture you can see with the H with the circle around it just on to the top of the pill which is why we only needed to UV project using a planar projection onto the top of the pill. So let me just render a final render of this using high quality and I will leave that with you as the final image for this tutorial.